to this week's Money Metals podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, this week's Market Wrap, with commentary and analysis from Money Metals Exchange, the company named Best Overall Precious Metals Dealer by Investopedia. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Michael Eason. Coming up, don't miss a must-hear interview with Michael Pento of Pento Portfolio Strategies. Michael covers a range of topics, including telling us how Fed policies have killed the middle class, why he believes the theory of an economic soft landing is nonsense, and why central planners hate deflation. So be sure to stick around for our very own Mike Meharry's conversation with our good friend Michael Pento coming up after this week's market update. As speculative fervor fuels price spikes in technology stocks and cryptocurrencies, gold continues to quietly hold its major support level. The monetary metal tested the critical $2,000 level again this week. After dipping earlier in the week, prices bounced modestly on Thursday as of this Friday recording. The gold market is posting a weekly loss of 0.7% to trade at $2,020 an ounce. The white metals, meanwhile, are outperforming. Silver's up 2.8% since last Friday's close to bring spot prices to $23.42 an ounce. Platinum looks higher by 2% to trade at $917. And finally, the beaten down palladium market is popping 6% this week to come in at $995 per ounce. The metal space remains unloved and underowned by the investing public, and the mainstream financial media is wholly uninterested in it. Hardly anyone is paying attention to the sector at all. But some of the few who are paying attention are spotting compelling opportunities. Even though retail investors are shunning anything related to precious metals, physical demand from industry, central banks, and consumers in the Far East is growing. The physical silver market is especially at risk of becoming stressed. The Silver Institute's latest forecast is for total silver demand to reach 1.2 billion ounces in 2024. That would be the second highest on record. The industry-backed nonprofit expects a structural supply deficit to persist in the silver market for the fourth consecutive year. Silver Institute Executive Director Michael Dorenzio sees the silver price soaring to $30 per ounce later this year. A move above $30 per ounce would represent a massive technical breakout. The metal hasn't been able to climb above $30 since prices broke down in 2013. Of course, gold is much closer than silver to making new highs. The yellow metal is in what could be described as a stealth bull market. Prices are holding firm just below all-time highs, despite the fact that gold isn't even on the radar of the investing public. Disinterest among the public is evidenced by the fact that exchange-traded products linked to gold prices have seen massive outflows. Meanwhile, gold mining companies have been trashed, sending valuations toward historic lows. Sentiment in the precious metal space is at the polar opposite of the hyped-up high-tech sector. Artificial intelligence stocks and the so-called Magnificent Seven big-tech behemoths are all the rage. Microsoft alone recently attained a market capitalization of $3 trillion. Bitcoin has come roaring back over $50,000. Day trading of high-volatility options has exploded. Investors have become speculators, and speculators have become gamblers. They don't know or care whether their holdings represent good long-term value anymore. All they care about is whether they might go up the next day, or the next hour, or even the next minute. Financial recklessness is showing up throughout the economy. Consumers are burning through savings and running up credit card debt. Americans lost record amounts in Las Vegas casinos last month, and wagered record amounts on the Super Bowl this month. Congress and the Biden administration, meanwhile, are gambling with America's finances and the standing of its currency by running up record budget deficits. Unsound fiscal policy, unsound financial markets, and unsound personal finances are all related to the absence of sound money. When the supply of fiat currency is unlimited and its value is perpetually declining, people feel incentivized to borrow, spend, and speculate, often to excess. It's fun while the good times are rolling, but there is no free lunch. Artificial booms eventually go bust, and prudent investors who buy assets that have real value and solid fundamental prospects eventually get rewarded. Well now, without further delay, let's get right to our exclusive interview with the wonderfully insightful Michael Pento. 
I'm Mike Meharry. I'm an analyst and content producer for Money Metals, and I'm here today with Michael Pinto, who serves as the president and founder of Pinto Portfolio Strategies. He's also the author of a book, The Coming Bond Market Collapse, and I'm excited to talk to him today. Michael, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, and thank you for having me on the program, Michael. So to kind of kick things off, can you just first give the audience uh, who might not be familiar with you a brief overview of your background, how you got into this crazy world of investing? So we'll fast forward then, I guess, uh, to uh, when I started. I started at a, a discount brokerage house called uh, Scottsdale Securities, um, and that's was the early 90s. Um, and then I quickly moved to um, the New York Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm in the middle to late 90s. Uh, then I started my own firm uh, in 2012 after, and let me just reverse that for a little bit. I actually um, worked for a, uh, a company called Delta Global okay. and in Europe Pacific Capital um, as an economist there. And uh, I was regularly on, I, I wrote, a, I wrote a, uh, a, a white paper dissertation, whatever you want to call it, uh, in 2000, in late 2005, talking about the um, the housing bubble and how it was going to wow. burst and affect the economy, and that that paper was picked up by the Wall Street Journal, and and that paper, which was picked up by the Wall Street Journal, was then read by the producers at the Cudlow and Company program mm -hmm. on CNBC, and then I became a regular on CNBC. They needed a straw man to 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 knock down. <laughs> Right. And, you know, I was like to ride it on and everybody would laugh at me. It's like, oh, you know, this guy, idiot, just obviously unqualified to even be on television. Um, what does he what does he know about housing? Right. But uh, God works in mysterious ways. So they <laughs> so maybe I ended up helping people uh, avoid getting uh, run, run over by a steamroller because home yeah. prices dropped 33 percent. Um, and the market lost 50% as it has a tendency to do uh, as of late. And then um, I started my own firm in 2012. I launched my inflation, deflation, and economic cycle portfolio in 2016. And uh, and uh, the predicate there is to how do I invest in bubbles and participate in them safely, but know when to get the heck out of harm's way and sprint for the emergency exit. So that's the, the predicate behind the understanding and launching the inflation, deflation, and economic cycle portfolio. And now I'm on the show with you. Awesome. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the highlight of your career right here, I, I have oh, to tell you. <laughs> this, is the, this is the pinnacle. Uh, the so you were one of those one of those handful of people who actually saw what was coming down the pike. And I think that kind of um, alludes to the fact that you know you don't have to know anything about housing if you understand monetary policy and, and the way uh, the powers that be create these bubbles in, in the boom bust cycle, and uh, it, it's fantastic that you've got a, a, an idea or a system in place to take advantage of. It because it's the world we live in, and we can rail against the the Fed and the government all we want to, but they're going to keep doing what they're doing. So uh, it's incumbent upon us if we want to protect our wealth and, and grow our wealth to be able to operate within that paradigm. Well, you know, you had me versus uh, Ben Bernanke, who was, you know, I'm obviously, you know, I don't have a PhD in e in economics, right? Uh, but he has one, and he's surrounded by about eighty of them, mm -hmm. and that seemed to help him very much because he said that the subprime mortgage crisis was contained. Yes, after he did. Claiming, <laughs> after claiming that there was no crisis in the subprime mortgage. Yeah. And if there was one, it wouldn't spill over to the regular economy. So um, it helps to it helps to have a reasonable amount of intelligence, a whole heck of a lot of hard work, and to not have an agenda, Michael. Yeah, you just can't have an agenda. His agenda was to his agenda of like all Federal Reserve officials, this cabal of money printing maniacs. Their their real purpose for existence is to protect and bail out. Banks. Mm -hmm. It is not to protect the poor, right? Let, let, let's make no mistake about it. I mean, the poor or the lower two quintiles of the uh, United States consumers—they can't afford a house any longer, correct? And how did that happen? How did home prices go up twenty percent uh, uh, two years in a row post COVID? It happened by osmosis. No, mm -hmm. 
They, the government locked the doors, told people you couldn't go out of your house, you couldn't produce anything, and then printed um, four and a half trillion dollars and handed six trillion of it because uh, they borrowed some to right. from um, and handed out to people checks in the mail called helicopter money, and then wondered how they you know oh, why why is it that we had um, uh, I, the way we calculated here um, nineteen to twenty percent inflation. Highest we've ever seen in this country, and and four years after COVID, we still have three percent inflation, which is over three, which is fifty percent above their asinine two percent target, as I like to say. Right. Well, I mean, Michael, the the inflation was transitory. Didn't you get that memo? Yeah. I guess I, I guess we abandoned that narrative a while any, back. Michael, we haven't seen anything yet because. There's there's going to be another crisis coming, and the re the reason why I say it is not because I'm some you know Pavlovian bear. I'm not right. that. It's just that there hasn't been anything remedied. The, the conditions have gotten worse, so th there's been no deleveraging. Total. I look at this figure for. I'll give you one a couple of figures. Total non financial debt as a percentage of GDP reached 227% prior to the global financial crisis in 2007. Right. That figure is now 263%. <laughs> and so don't tell me all this debt doesn't matter. Right. When interest rates have gone from zero to 5.3% on the effective Fed funds rate. It, yeah. it matters. Of course it does. And, uh, and, and we're seeing that, I think, you and I are certainly seeing it. I think if you take the time to look at what's going on, it's pretty apparent that, you know, I say this all the time. People are worried that this higher interest rate environment might break something in the economy. I argue that they broke something in the economy more than a decade ago when they pivoted into this perpetual, you know, artificially low interest rates and the loose monetary policy and, and all of those things. But we have a narrative going on today, right? The, the narrative is kind of price inflation basically under control, you know, the last CPI report notwithstanding, or it, at least they'll say it's trending in the right direction. And the Federal Reserve is going to start cutting interest rates soon, and the economy is going to glide into this mythical soft landing. What is your gut reaction to this storyline? Okay, so um, first of all, let, let's just Let's just talk about uh, what you just mentioned about the Federal Reserve and their interest rate policy. Mm -hmm. They they have destroyed the middle class in this country. Yeah. Um, if you look at David Stockman, does a lot of good work on this. If you look at the relationship between the the, the top, you know, point oh one percent and the assets they hold, depend and and compare that to the percent of assets that the the lowest portion, the lowest quintile of the country, it's it's been the, the yawning gap has never been more trenchant. And it, it solely exists because of the Federal Reserve. Right. So let's go back to your point. And I want one more point about the Federal Reserve before I move on. If you people say, and I used to have a fight with Steve Leisman on CNBC about this all the time. And I used to say, we don't need the Federal Reserve. He said, well, what would you do? Like, like, <laughs> would, like uh, how would we, how would we function as if the Federal Reserve was, you know, around when, you know, when, right. Moses, when Moses got the Ten Commandments. Um, you know, we didn't have a Federal Reserve in this country until 1913, right. and we had a <laughs> we had a wonderful economy mm -hmm. uh, before before that happened. And if you allowed the money supply, the base money supply, which is what the Fed con it basically controls, um, if you allowed the base money supply to grow commensurate with the mine supply supply of gold, mm -hmm. which is happens to be commensurate with productivity. And population growth, you would never have an inflation problem in this country. Right. But when you expand the M2 money supply by, you know, 30 percent, 40 percent in a year, right. you're going to have a huge problem with inflation because the, the GDP growth can't keep up with that. Right. And, and that is by definition inflation. I think people forget that. They focus on the, the rising consumer prices. The inflation yeah, right. is this increase in money. The rising prices is a symptom. Of that, and they've conflated those terms, I think, on right. purpose to kind of obscure where the problem actually lies. And here, and here's where the rubber actually meets the road with inflation. So, it's, of course, inflation is increasing the money supply, and money supply is inflated. But even it, even more important than that, in my in my 33 years of doing this, is what you what, what the consequences of doing that, and the consequences of that inflation, is what is it serves to destroy the market's perception 
of the purchasing power of the currency. Yeah. And that's when you get inflation is when people, you know, if you hand people money and they go out and, 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 and purchase capital goods with that and increase production, it's not such a bad thing. But when you hand people money and people understand, well, wait, I'm not going to invest this money. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to create capital goods with this money. I'm going to consume right. with this money as quickly as possible because tomorrow its purchasing power is going to be destroyed. That's when you get into this hyperinflation. In right. loop. And I, and I, and here's the problem, Mike, if I just can touch on this, the, the next time we have a problem in the economy is it, the Fed is going to have to cut rates substantially and quickly in the next 24 months, because mm-hmm. I think the soft landing is BS. Yeah. And the reason why it's BS is because, you know, I, I have to just touch on this one for, for one, one point I want to make. So the Fed started cutting rates in 2007. And it wasn't until a year after they started cutting rates that there was a problem, a major problem in, in, in the economy and in the housing market. I think the Fed's going to start cutting rates probably in the next, say, say around May or June. But the economy might not melt down until sometime in 25. I think it could be before that, but let, even if it was 25, you have to look at history and show what happens when the Fed raises rates from 1% to five and a quarter, as they did from 2003 to 2006. And when they raise rates from 0% in 2022 to uh, 2023, when they started in 22, right? I know I lost my track, but I, <laughs> I was March. I believe it was March of 22. Yeah, I, mean, I think you're right. I think that was the first. I think that was the so first. They, so they went from zero percent off the zero percent bound in March of 22, and they stopped hiking rates in the summer of last year mm-hmm. at five and a quarter. The effect five and a quarter to five point five, which is effective Fed funds rate, is five point three percent. Right. It takes some time, mm-hmm. about a year, for that to filter through the economy. So we haven't seen the effect of these interest rate hikes yet. And if I hate, I hate to get a little bit in the weeds, Mike, but the reverse repo facility is actually money from banks, this Fed credit that was sitting fallow on the Fed's balance sheet out of the economy. That has been coming. That was a two and a half trillion dollars, that, that reverse repo facility. Mm-hmm. That money has been pouring into the economy and offsetting the Fed's quantitative tightening program. Right. There's now about $500 billion left in, in the reverse repo facility. That money will be run dry around late March or early or early April, according to my uh, the vector of, of the decline of that mm-hmm. facility. In Mar- on March 11th, so, so let me just figure that, finish that thought. On, so when that happens, there'll be no more of this liquidity pouring into the economy. And then that's when QT will actually begin to bite and affect the liquidity that's available for gambling in the stock market and gambling on NVIDIA and, and gambling on, on, on in the bond market, which right. we could talk about that later too. I know you want to get to that. So um, on March 11th, which is not too far away, right. the bank term funding program expires. Yep. And that was, I called for a recession to happen in 2023. Um, and the recession was beginning to manifest. And I say that because the entire regional banking system went into meltdown mode. Right. And it was bailed out by the printing of these money printing maniacs by yep. a $400 billion they printed in two weeks. Mm-hmm. And then they said, hey, banks, I know you hold a lot of, because we raised rates from zero to 5% in, in two years. I'm sorry, less than, way less than two years. Um, all of your assets are underwater, mortgage-backed securities, commercial mortgage-backed securities, treasuries, they're all underwater, and it's breaking the banking system, and the yield curve's inverted, and I understand this. So I will take all of your assets at par value, <laughs> even though they're at 70, 80 cents on the dollar, yep. and I'll give, you, I'll give you all that credit, 100 cents on the dollar, and I'll hold them for, from you for a year, and you can go out and gamble on, on Bitcoin mm-hmm. if you want to, and, and bonds and, 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 and NVIDIA. And the AI stocks, if you want to. On March 11th, the banks have to hand back to the Fed 100 cents on the dollar 
They're going to get their mortgage back securities. They're going to get their treasuries. They're going to get the CMBS back too. Mm-hmm. And it's more underwater today than it was right. in March 2023. So tell me how that's going to go. So I don't believe the soft rant landing narrative because we have the lag effects of raising rates. We have a bankrupt regional banking system. Mm-hmm. In fact, the whole financial system is under is under duress. Yeah. That'll come, that'll be exposed. The veil will be listed, lifted on that in March. Um, we have the reverse repo facility running dry as well. And we have all the debt that we have plus some plus that we some. had going into going into uh, the great financial crisis. And I'll make one one more final point is that the market value of, of the market value of equities as a percentage of the underlying economy has never been higher. Right. It's, prior to 2020, before we in, engaged in helicopter money, it, it was below the current figure of 180 percent total market cap of equities as a percentage of GDP. It has never been higher outside of that small area that we had in 2021. Mm-hmm. So it was higher than the it was higher than it was by a lot before we had 1929. Right. <laughs> the, the Great Depression. Higher than it was in 2000. And higher than it was in 2008. Yep. By many, many, many percentage points. Like dozens of percentage points. Well, you and I are on the exactly the uh, the same page in terms of how, of how we view the trajectory of things. Before we wrap up, I do want to touch on bonds because, after all, you did write a book about it, and uh, the title resonates with me. Um, but I have to admit that they seem to keep managing to float things down the river a lot farther than I expect them to. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of Jim Grant. I'm, I'm, I imagine you probably are too. And he's argued that we are on I the am. cusp of a generational bear market in bonds. Um, and, and he kind of relies on historical trends. He looks back at these kind of 30, 40 year cycles in the bond market. Totally makes sense. Um, and obviously, this would be a huge problem for the U.S. government. They're already having a huge problem. Uh, you know, we, you can look at the interest expense right now. Uh, they're paying more for interest expense than they are for national defense, which is kind of insane. Um, but trillion dollars. Yeah, it's insane. So when when you look at this, obviously there there are huge problems in the bond market. But a skeptic would say to you, because when we're talking about a bear market, people have to understand that we're talking about the price of bonds dropping and uh, concurrently yields rising. So we're talking about higher interest rates, and people just say, well, the Fed can fix that because they're going to cut rates. So we really, we really don't have to worry about this. Why don't you think the powers that be can get the handle on on the? I guess a, a bond bubble is probably the best way to look at it. I wrote I wrote the book in 2013. Um, it wasn't it didn't say the bond bubble is going to burst that year. Right. It said that this is where we're inevitably going to head. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, the, the predicate on that book was that eventually we're going to break the back of deflation, which was the problem. And, and I'll put that I'll put that. I'm not in video, but my hands are in quotations. The right. problem. Yeah, yeah. Deflation. Exactly. I think I think deflation is a wonderful thing. Oh my gosh, prices are going down. <laughs> I think a mild a mild, a mild deflation is wonderful. Right. I mean, you should expect it with the, the natural. With the, yeah, the as natu- production increases. Of, yeah, it's a natural. Right. It's a natural byproduct of productivity. Um, I mean, no one was complaining when Henry Ford's you know Model T brought the price of automobiles down. It's like, right. oh my gosh, I, I wish they were more expensive. Yeah, I sure uh, do wish yeah. I could. I sure do wish I could pay a thousand dollars for a yeah. for a twenty four inch yeah. TV again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so, um, but that but that's what happens when you have the, the horrific cabal called the Federal Reserve or all central banks, all fiat currencies ha- suffer the same thing. Sure. But the problem now is we have we so from 1981 all the way to 2020, we the problem the salient issue was well deflation. I mean, they they the Federal Reserve wrote books about this and like, uh, you know, how do we get out of this deflation? Oh right. my gosh! So we can't we can't create inflation by what we do. Uh, and they and you say, ask, ask yourself, well, why do they need inflation? Because we have a bubble economy. Right. It's, you know, wealth is derived. This is why we hate the organization of the central banks so much. Central banks, because they want to they want to have two percent inflation gives them a lot of cushion to you know to keep asset bubbles afloat. Right. 
to keep the stock market r- rising. It does. It's not in real terms. It's inflation. Mm-hmm. You, your house, which is a, de- a degrading asset, goes up, you know, several percentage points above inflation. Right. And that makes people happy because it creates wealth. It yeah, creates the, wealth the illusion. Right. It creates the illusion of wealth, mm-hmm. not for renters. <laughs> right. Not for people who don't have a huge 401k plan. Mm-hmm. So that's the, the, the trench and growing gap between the the wealthiest of us and the and the poor. Yeah. And you can't run an economy with without a, a vibrant middle class. But let's just talk about bonds. Okay. So we have two trillion dollar deficits. Uh debt to GDP at 134, 135%. Right. This is the highest than ever, even even higher than World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, two trillion dollar deficits in an economy that's supposedly enjoying full employment. Right. So during recessions, the deficit tends to rise um, by triple. The right. deficits tend to triple. Mm-hmm. So, so you have a situation now that if I'm correct, and we're going to have a recession, and that's when income to the treasury plummets. Right. And that is when the automatic stabilizers kick in, you know, mm-hmm. unemployment insurance. You can have a deficit that's five, six trillion dollars easily per annum. So that's a massive amount of supply. So when you look at the long end of the yield curve, what usually happens in a recession, Mike, is that the Fed drops the interest rate on the short end of the curve the mo- right. in the money markets, and the and Treasury bills drop along with it because they compete with Fed funds. Mm-hmm. goes to goes to zero percent, and the long end tends to come down too. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the healing process because people have debt that's, you know, they, they, it's un, unsustainable. Right. And when you have unsustainable level of debt, it's unserviceable. What happens is what well, you reduce the interest payment on that debt, and that tends to make the debt problem go away. You default right. on the debt, interest payments come down, mm-hmm. economy heals, and you get, you, you get out of the recession. Right. So, um, so, so and in, and in, 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 sorry for the phone. Um, so in the next time we have a recession, there's a salient problem. Is the salient problem will be that we no longer have a problem with deflation. We have a problem with inflation. We right. just exited, in reality, nine. In reality, the way they count reality, nine percent inflation. But in actual reality, it was twenty percent inflation. Right. We still have inflation that's 50% above their target. Mm-hmm. So if we start printing money, let's just say that we have a recession, the Fed goes back to ZERP, back to QE, uh, launches the the TALF, the TARP, the BTFB, they just unload the bazooka. Right. Which, the which is, that's the fork they know, right? That's, that's, a, what, that's, that's what history, that's history says they'll do. They have to do it because they have to bail out banks. Right. So now the long end of the yield curve, which is concerned with two things. Inflation, uh, the, the the rate of inflation, mm-hmm. and the su- supply of right. treasury, supply right. demand. That's the long end. Mm-hmm. Now the supply is going to go through the roof, and inflation, which is already a problem, which just exited the biggest inflation we've ever had, but still above trend. Inflation, which is a huge problem, is going to cause the long end of the yield curve. The price is to drop and yields to go up. Right. It's not going to drop like it already, you know, like it always does and like it always has in the past. Mm-hmm. And in that case, there will be no automatic healing of the economy. Because if you look at, you know, how housing costs, I'm sorry, um, mortgage rates, which are pinned to the to LIBOR now so far and 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 the and the benchmark treasury, they're mm-hmm. not going to come down. No. Like, and if that's the case, if I'm correct, then there's going to be a condition of stagflation in this country like we've never seen before. Higher bond yields, higher rates of inflation, and crippling negative economic growth. Yeah. I make my case. That's my that's that's the real danger. In long end of the yield curve may not drop anywhere near if at all, like it usually does, providing no relief, no relief to borrowers, no relief to corporations. The only relief is going to become in the money markets, rising rates of inflation, 
and devastating a devastating and protracted economic contraction. That's the danger. I completely agree with what you're saying. Great way of explaining it. It, it. I think it's poignant to point out that the Fed can force that short end down with its monetary policy. It's much more difficult to do that. They don't the control long. the long, yeah, they don't control right. the long end of the yield curve. That's yield, the long end of the yield curve is said is concerned with inflation and the supply demand dynamics. Now, right, and and listen, normally the long long end of the yield curve falls in sympathy with the money market rate, the Fed funds rate, mm-hmm. but not when you have six trillion dollar deficits, a tsunami of supply hitting the market, and everybody knows, Mike. If we have a problem with the, with the economy now. The Federal Reserve can no longer tell the market for our currency that they'll be able to supply us with a real federal funds rate. Right. In other words, one that's above inflation. We know what right. ha- we'll know what happens. So this happened too many times in the past. You have a habit of destroying the purchasing power of our currency, printing you know trillions of dollars, which Federal Reserve officials back when I was cutting my teeth in the business would go out and, and, and a vow, they would have promised, that will never happen in this country. It only happens in Argentina right. and in Zimbabwe and in, maybe in Hungary. Uh, you know, th- These are the countries, you know, Weimar, Germany. Uh, you know, That's the countries, that's the time that it happened. We'll never do that here. Well, right. you, did, you did it here. And you had the same consequences. You had the beginnings of the, the fracturing and the erosion of the purchasing, the faith in the purchasing power of our currency and the, the value of our sovereign debt. And I think part two of that is going to be very devastating. And it's coming. Unfortunately, it's coming because, Mike, we have solved none of our problems. Our problems have been artificial manipulation of markets, mm-hmm. massive amount of debt and asset bubbles. And tell me what problem we've solved. Right. We've, we've just exacerbated it. Worse. Yeah. We've exacerbated it. And we solved nothing. So that's why we're going to have another problem. And right. you have to know how to navigate that and invest around it because you can't he- sit here and say, well, I have a 60 40 portfolio. You know, I'm right. I, 60% or, stocks. Or just complain and say, well, they, they shouldn't do that. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's true. They shouldn't. So, with that in mind, we probably ought to wrap up at this point, okay. but do let people know where they can find you and learn about how to navigate this in a way that uh, will help them preserve their wealth and, and, and hopefully even increase it. So at pentoport.com, that's the website, pentoport.com, you'll find a link to a mid- midweek reality check podcast, which I put all my thoughts down every Wednesday night. And you can get that for a free trial, a five-week free trial. It's $50 a year. $50 a year if you want to listen to it. Uh, actually get the valuable, like the you if you want the CNBS spin on things, or don't don't subscribe. But if you want the real, like if you want to know why the the non-farm payroll report for for this past January was horrific, not mm-hmm. a blowout number. Well, I go through all the numbers to right. let you know that it was horrific. Yeah. Uh, the numbers you need to know. Um, that's fifty dollars a year. And if you have a hundred thousand dollars to invest. And you're a U.S. citizen, and you qualify for the for the IDEC, the inflation deflation economic cycle model strategy. I will manage your money personally and let you know where you should invest on the yield curve, mm-hmm. when you should buy short term debt, when you need to buy long term debt, when you need to short the bond market, and when you need to get he- the the heck out of harm's way, which I think could be, you know, Q2 of this year. Awesome. Well, we'll send people your direction. I appreciate you taking a little bit of time to uh, to chat today, and uh, really enjoy. You have a, you have a great way of breaking this all down in a way that folks can can uh, wrap their heads around, and I think that's important in this day and age when there's so much, um, I don't know, BS out there for lack of a lack of a more polite term. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Well, we'll we'll wrap this up and uh, hopefully we can chat again in the near future. And uh, again, appreciate your wisdom and your insights. Thanks for having me on, Mike. Well, after a few years, it was great to hear from Michael Penno again, and I hope you enjoyed that interview. And that will do it for this week. Be sure to check back next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. And if you enjoyed that interview there, be sure to check out Money Metal's midweek memo hosted by Mike Meharry. 
I strongly encourage you to check out Mike's podcast each week if you're not already doing so. Just go to moneymetals.com forward slash podcasts or find that on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Until next time, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening and have a wonderful President's Day weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by to answer your call during business hours, Monday through Saturday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.